let me introduce you to a guy named Carl Pierre. Carl was 25 years old when he became an employee at the WeWork office in D.C. He was just a few years out of college. He was excited about joining this fast-growing startup. And he was surprised by how much of his job involved working with beer, tapping a beer keg, getting licenses to serve beer. And one morning, he got a call. There had been a beer disaster. And this one dude who turns out was like a guest of a member or something, was so like gung-ho trying to get beer out, he broke the tap, beer started pouring out, and he just walked away. So I get a call the next day, the very next day, from the shoe store underneath our Chinatown location saying, dude, everything, all of our inventory is covered in gross, sticky beer. Like, what the hell is going on? And I look through the security recordings, and I'm like, oh, I wanted to scream and, like, break everything. I was like, this guy, <laughs> this dude, just, oh. It was like, you know, a keg holds, what, 99 beers? So imagine 99 beers pouring down and pooling. And, oh, yeah, of course it leaked through. I had to take out my iPhone and take photos from the insurance company. Oh, it was this whole thing. Beer was a central part of WeWork's brand. And here it was, leaking through the floor. And it was just like pools of beer. The entire place smelled like a brewery. So not only did our space smell like awfulness, like it smelled like a yeast factory because it just kind of like percolated over the night too. Once all the beer poured out, it just stayed that way. And then, you know, the guy's floor too. It just smelled like the entire block. It smelled like beer because when you open the door, it's like, oof. A full keg is so much booze. There's so much liquid in it. Imagine pouring all that onto the floor and letting it just walking away for hours. Hours. You're listening to Foundering. I'm your host, Ellen Hewitt. In the previous episode, we visited Adam Newman's childhood kibbutz. We wanted to understand how it inspired WeWork and Adam's ideas about community. And today, in episode two of our season on WeWork, we're going to tell you about what it was like inside WeWork during its early chaotic years of growth as the company burst onto the business scene. We'll start around 2012. We're a few years after the financial crash, and the business world is getting back on its feet. There's a huge rise in remote work, a huge rise in distributed work. That's Teddy Kramer, an early WeWork employee. There are companies that don't even have office space that empower their employees to work from wherever they are. But we're still human. We're still, you know, creatures that want to be around other people. Uh, and people need places. Facebook had just gone public. LinkedIn, too. And there was this buzz in the air, especially around startups. 2012, 2013, when it was very early, when it was exciting, when that kind of startup dream was at its peak. I remember Instagram had just been bought by Facebook for a billion dollars. So that idea that anyone could just sit there, a couple of people, build an app and get rich. Ranjan Roy was an early customer at WeWork. He had just quit his job to become an entrepreneur. And in fact, it was Teddy who sold Ranjan his WeWork membership. This is great because I get to go back to all my cheesy sales lines that I used to give to prospective members. Um, my favorite line I used to use was that it's a Fortune 500 experience when you're not yet a Fortune 500 company. Teddy's customers were mostly small businesses, freelancers, and entrepreneurs. For them, getting office space was a challenge. Most leases required a commitment of several years. WeWork offered something different. You could easily rent a desk or a small office month by month. I think in those early days, it worked. I loved the idea of the facility. I need a conference room. Great, I can walk in and book it. I you know, need a desk that's inexpensive and uh, is non-committal in the traditional you know, commercial real estate sense. Um, and also, I want to be around like-minded people. I want to be, be around people who are going through the same struggles and going through the same challenges, but also who want to celebrate my success. Ranjan, who was working out of a WeWork office in New York, was happy to be alongside other startup founders. But more importantly, he felt WeWork was selling him something else. It was selling him a sense of legitimacy. They delivered a great product, the actual space itself. It validated you, especially when you're kind of an early stage startup flailing around. The space was nice enough that, you know, you have a meeting, people come in, they think you are doing something correct. My parents, who as Indian parents were very nervous about me doing something startup-y in my 30s, they came and they saw, and this is when we were at the WeWork at 222 Broadway, which was on the 20th floor, this kind of like gleaming view of the financial district. And again, they thought we must be doing something right. And at the time, we weren't. <laughs> Ranjan's desk at his WeWork office was next to something particularly important. 
the fruit water. It's a big jug of drinking water that has fruit cut up into it. Kind of fancy. So one thing I definitely remember from the time was the fruit water. Somehow this kind of became a central sales point for the WeWork uh, employees. And even Adam Newman, anytime there are investors in there, or even if he was bringing around people to show off the space, he would bring them straight to the fruit water, talk about it loudly and proclaim, you know, we're in the midst of the future of work and offer the fruit water. Okay, so let's back up for a minute. Yes, we are actually talking about water that has chopped up fruit floating in it. Throughout the course of this story, there's going to be a lot of silly things that are actually important. Fruit water is one of those things. It sounds small, but it became a symbol of the WeWork brand in all their offices around the world. And people got really into it. The other day, I was looking it up on Twitter, and I found a picture where the fruit water had cantaloupe in it, cut into the shape of dolphins. Cantaloupe dolphins. Yeah, actually, one time I can say, I looked up and I was sitting on some kind of ball, looked to my left, and Elliot Spitzer was standing right there, kind of looking over, looking across the entire uh, entire floor with a smile on his face. Elliot Spitzer, for those of you who don't know, is the former, somewhat disgraced governor of New York. And he was getting Adam's pitch to investors. Look at this excitement and energy. Adam was using WeWork's paying customers to attract more money. It was almost like we were animals in a zoo or rats in a lab. Like, people would just kind of stand on the periphery and watch everyone sitting there. So if you are an older investor who has no idea what's happening and suddenly you just see young kids in shorts with laptops and, uh, and you, your entire construction of work in your mind forever has been suits and offices and cubicles, it would definitely feel like maybe the secret is here. And it did feel like there was something more here than just the desks. That was intentional on WeWork's part. From Ranjan's point of view, WeWork was doing the same thing as a lot of other rapidly growing companies in the 2010s. They weren't just selling a product. They were selling something much bigger than that. The desks were good. I mean, the product was a very good one, but it had to be about so much more, and it couldn't just be stopped at, we're going to sell you a good desk in a fun environment. Like, it had to be about transforming humanity. You're selling the we generation and transformational future of work and life and the way we interact. You know, Uber called itself ride-sharing, even though it was just kind of a modernized taxi fleet. But they had that community word embedded into it. And yeah, Adam was constantly evoking community when talking about work. It's that community being surrounded by a group of like-minded individuals, being part of something bigger than yourself, inspires people to work harder, spend more time at work, and just have fun doing it. WeWork wasn't the only co-working space that was active at the time, so it had rivals paying attention to how it ran its business. One of those rivals was Industrious. Its CEO, Jamie Hodari, noticed a few things about WeWork. Jamie was confused by WeWork because Adam spent more time talking about community than he did fast internet or clean office space. Jamie had done customer research and found that the idea of we wasn't that important to people who just wanted to rent a desk. But WeWork was also expanding so rapidly. It had gone from zero to a billion dollar valuation in less than four years. It left Jamie wondering, was WeWork onto something that he wasn't able to see? One of many ways in which I think as a WeWork competitor, you're stuck saying, like, do they not really get it? Is it that they are out of touch with what the actual nature of rising demand is or the actual reasons are that adoption rates are rising of their product? Or is it that they're on another level? They're seeing around the next corner, you know, they're seeing everything we're seeing and then the stuff that comes after that or the stuff that people care about but can't actually articulate or put into words. So Jamie was questioning whether people really wanted to pay for community, for the aspirational, scrappy culture that WeWork was selling. The slogans on its walls saying, better together, do what you love, always exploring, cheers. Jamie didn't get why Adam never talked directly about real estate or business plans. Instead, he talked about humanity and enlightenment. I think that was maybe the first sniff or the first moment of saying this company has a kind of oblique 
indirect way of approaching things, that it wasn't a company given to straight talk, basically. Um, and that ended up becoming a predictor of a lot of things to come. Adam wanted to do loftier things. He wanted to transform humanity. And in his mind, the first step to that was transforming work. He wanted to do it by making work fun. It sounds simple, but it was a pretty novel idea. And he put it into action at WeWork. It sells fun. I mean, it sells excitement. You don't even have to go out to a bar or a club. We will bring that all to your office space where you sit and do work. It's a pretty good deal. The bar is now at your desk. We give free beer in all of our buildings. We gave 90,000 glasses of beer last month, which is a number we're proud of. People are staying late at the office. The parties take place at the office itself. It's that commingling of life and work and kind of like lack of division between your office and partying or going out to a bar. To create that environment, community managers like Teddy had to learn how to do a lot of random manual tasks, like tapping the beer keg or grabbing a bunch of members to film a viral video meme. Uh, and for those who love to Google, if you can find the WeWork Labs uh, Harlem Shake video, I highly recommend you look it up. It's actually pretty fun. Um, I'm the mermaid in the bottom right corner, nice. so you can find me. Um, I'm right there. Uh, but th but to me, that was that was amazing. That was so much fun, right? Oh she wow! Is. Oh, that is oh, that's you in the mermaid. That's me in the mermaid. That's quite a look. So I'm wearing a purple shell bra, and those are real shells uh, that I had to get custom tailored to stay up. Um, I had a custom uh, mermaid skirt, um, and I am front and center dancing as a mermaid uh, while making sure that my shells stay up. Um, you asked how I felt. I loved it. I thought it was so much fun. WeWork had something different. It was work, but it was fun, which may have come from Adam himself. He has this reputation publicly of being out of control, aggressive, a partier, a deal maker, but he was also just entertaining. Here's Jamie again. The impression you get when you spend a bit of time with him is not just of this kind of tall, brash force of nature, but also of someone who seems like he's having fun. You know, when you hear these landlords saying, we did a whirlwind tour of this city and we drank tequila and whatever, you know, maybe the unspoken magnetism of it is in part that business isn't often that fun. You know, it's, it's dry. And so spending the day with someone who seems like they're on this rocket ship and loving every minute of it, that's the most magnetic thing of all. This magnetism also pulled in prospective employees. When Carl, the community manager in D.C., walked into a WeWork office for his first interview, he had never seen anything like it. I was blown away by the aesthetics and the, the electricity of the room of where these people were working. It was just an entirely, entirely different and very, very young, very my generation vibe to the entire place. Carl joined WeWork in 2013, and he felt like he had tumbled into a millennial wonderland. The mid-century modern everything, um, the fact that they had like cold brew on tap and all the brands I loved all under one roof. It was just a, it, w it was overload almost. Um, and it, it really sold me on the concept. WeWork was a company that celebrated bringing people together. And they put that into practice with their own employees every week. Every Monday night, WeWork held an all hands meeting and it lasted for hours. And it was called Thank God It's Monday, TGIM for short. Here's Cody Quinn, an early employee. So TGIMs were, they, ugh, I hated those. So they had these company-wide meetings called Thank God It's Monday. Um, I, I literally get goosebumps thinking about it because Mondays were rough. Thank God It's Monday was meant to be something fresh and different, a celebration about loving your work. But many employees seemed to hate it. It meant staying late at work after a long day, often without overtime pay. It was a lot of posturing, it was a lot of like egos. People just kind of like peacocking on stage, like, thank God it's Monday. Like they just wanted to be cool and like flex their position. And sometimes these meetings turned into celebrations for the growing business, emceed by Adam. Here's Cody again. You know, I, like after him talking about himself for like a half hour, like he's like, all right, we're having a party. And then all of a sudden these trays of tequila shots come out and, and like it's this big party. And like even to the extent that they're they were encouraging people to get drunk enough that they would pay for Uber's home. 
WeWork isn't the only company partying like this in the 2010s. If you worked at a startup any time in the last decade, maybe some of this sounds familiar to you. Staying late in the office for mandatory parties, free booze, the blurring of life and work. What makes WeWork special is that they took startup culture to the next level. They were actually selling this culture to their customers. And WeWork found that there was a huge appetite for it. The office party that never ends. We'll be right back. So before the break, we talked about WeWork's Thank God It's Monday meetings. These all-hands meetings are a really important aspect of WeWork's company culture. It's how WeWork rallied the troops and shared the inside take on what was going on at this rapidly growing company. Here's Miguel McKelvey warming up the crowd for Adam at one of these meetings. Um, is just as excited as I am, and I'm happy to introduce Adam, our CEO. And I'm going to play for you recordings of several of these meetings from 2015 and 2016, right in the middle of WeWork's rise. These tapes were never meant to be heard outside of the company, ever. And they capture this very intriguing and revealing aspect of WeWork, this internal rah-rah. You'll be hearing snippets throughout the season. Hey, Adam, nice to meet you. Gina, hey, Adam, nice to meet you. Hey, I know you. Just to set the scene, in these meetings, Adam is usually speaking in front of a podium. WeWork employees are crowded around him, sitting on the floor because it's so packed. In one of the videos, he's wearing a black T-shirt that says creator on it. He's standing in front of a gong with WeWork engraved on it. People that are over there, don't be shy. There's a lot of room. Let's sit a little bit in the back. Don't be shy. That's great. You can sit next to the gong. There's more seats over there. Don't be shy. This is a different Adam from the yearning kid struggling to fit in at the kibbutz. He's different also from the guy trying and failing to innovate high heels and baby clothing. He had just been featured in Forbes in a splashy spread titled Inside the Phenomenal Rise of WeWork. And now he's on stage, surrounded by his employees and telecasting to hundreds more. I can't get over how he keeps introducing himself. I'm Adam. Nice to meet you. As if they don't know who he is. They work for him. Adam, nice to meet you. Adam, nice to meet you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Part of what made working at WeWork so intense during these years was the company's rapid expansion. Let's just look at some numbers. Now, these numbers are, are actual numbers, so it is what it is. Adam used so these growth numbers to get his employees excited about what they were accomplishing. Just take a look at 2010, one building. 2011, four buildings. That means you added three. 2012, still added only three. 2013, we were sleeping. I'm not sure what we were doing. We added only two buildings. We're going backwards. And then 2014, which is when, and 2013 and 2014, which a lot of you came, we went from nine buildings to 23. We're now at 34 buildings, which means we've already added four new markets with Berkeley, Amsterdam, Chicago, and Austin, Texas. And the numbers then- were doubling or tripling year by year. Adam told them that what they were doing was completely unprecedented. Our physical growth in years 2016, 2017, and 2018, assuming we do similar to what we're planning or more, is going to be the fastest physical growth in the history of the world, at least as far as I can tell, at least for the past. I'm not sure about Roman times and some of those times. There might have been some very high growth uh, companies there. Okay, so here's my read on what he's saying. I think Adam is only half kidding here. He's obviously joking about there being startups during Roman times, but he's not joking when he says that WeWork is growing like no one else. They were opening up buildings all over the world, even though they'd only been around for a few years. So this video was taped in mid-2015, right before I started covering WeWork. At the time, they were seen as this hot, rising startup. The company was valued at $10 billion. Most of the media coverage marveled at how fast they were growing, how much money they'd raised, And they asked a few questions about whether it was really all it was hyped up to be, but there wasn't much criticism out there. When I started watching these videos of all-hands meetings, it was the first time that I got to hear what Adam was like inside the office. 
what he told his employees and not what he told reporters or the public. And it was really different from the shiny, polished narrative that WeWork put out there. In the tape, you hear Adam say things that are pretty revealing. Here he is addressing new hires gathered at the meeting. You guys are about to find out we're really nice to people in the first 30 days. Second 30 days, we're okay. By day 61, you'll know our truth. You'll know our truth. What strikes me here is how Adam is saying something weirdly ominous to his employees. It's kind of joking, but it's also clearly not a joke. I feel like I should take a moment here and tell you how I got these tapes. They were given to me by an employee. She was upset about how WeWork was operating. And after she shared the recordings, WeWork turned around and sued her. It's an interesting story. You'll hear it all in full later in the series. One of the most fun things is when you see a new employee and you know two things. One, they have no clue what they got themselves into. That's a fact. Whatever they think they know, whatever their friends told them, whatever you told them, they don't know. And no matter how much you're going to tell them, they won't know. They won't know until they did their first all-nighter. They won't know until they did their first summit. They won't know until they did their first summer camp. But until you get to experience all of that, you don't know. In 2016, I started talking to a lot of current and former WeWork employees. I wanted to understand the company better. And many of them told me about that whiplash that Adam was just describing. Their first few months on the job were a shock. Things were much more frantic than it seemed from the outside. This incredible growth, growth that Adam compared to Roman times, meant that internally it was chaos. Here's Teddy again. We opened up a building in New York, down in Soho. Um, We didn't have a functioning bathroom on the first day. Um, So I had to go down the block to a local coffee shop and buy out all of their pastries and told them that if someone came in with a WeWork uh, key card that they would be able to use the bathroom. There's the the saying, you, you know, you got three options, fast, cheap, and right. But you only get to pick two. What are you going to pick? You know, with WeWork, it was always fast and cheap. I know it sounds crazy to open an office with no bathroom, but there were so many more stories like this. Uh, When we opened up our first building in D.C., we didn't have coffee machines. So on Super Bowl Sunday, we were opening up the day after Super Bowl Sunday, I had to go to Costco and bought four Mr. Coffee, you know, personal coffee machines. And we were running four at a time, uh, blowing the breaker all morning, having to reset the electricity for it towards it. Um, But that's what you had to do. Then there was a time when WeWork was about to open a building in Berkeley. There was one wrinkle. They had installed a front door that wasn't accessible to people with disabilities. So uh, we evaluated and looked at it, and we determined that it was better to have no door than to have a non-compliant door. So for about three days after we opened up that location in Berkeley, in January of 2015, we had a literally no door on the building uh, with cold East Bay air blowing through. And I had to hire 24-7 security until we could get the door fixed. These screw-ups made WeWork customers unhappy. But Teddy said that the way to fix it was to offer them free brunch, a nice happy hour, or a discount on rent. Another community manager, Carl, had to deal with this too. You heard from him earlier. Building launches were the most stressful because paint was still drying when people moved in. And it was that under pressure. In Miami Beach, one of the offices failed inspection on the morning it was supposed to open, leaving members ready to move in stranded. And you have people who paid money showing up with boxes of things to move into their new office that were told they cannot go into that building. So WeWork, over the course of 48 hours, had to build a makeshift office across the street at this empty, like, commercial building. Paint it, make it look cool, give it a WeWork vibe get internet set up, get all these things set up. And they they pulled it off. Uh, It blows my mind. Like, they totally pulled it off. In D.C., where Carl worked, WeWork didn't have a liquor license for the free beer it was giving out. Carl tried to fix it. I had no idea what license to apply for. Am I a tavern? What the hell is a tavern? Keep in mind, Carl is 26, trying to figure out permits to satisfy some arcane municipal law. And he doesn't quite nail it. Carl is convinced that someone tipped off the cops. So I remember we actually had a a raid happen at all of our offices where it was almost like SWAT style, where all these cops are pouring in, like, where's the alcohol, where's the alcohol? And we're like, that keg over there, that's like in this beautiful marble center thing that's right over there. And they were like, where's the other? And it was, you know, I had my community managers calling me, freaking out. I was like, dude, cops are here, Carl. Like, what's going on? Carl was a city-level manager for WeWork's community team, a department name that sounds kind of vague, but that's also pretty common at big startups. 
Community workers are on the front lines. They manage WeWork's buildings. They're the ones who dealt with disasters. They were the first people you saw when you walked into a WeWork. Some sat at the front desk. They gave tours and sold new memberships, tapped the kegs, fixed the printer, handled anything that came up, really. They also hosted events in the buildings. That often meant really long hours. They were usually the first ones into the building and the last ones out. So then you'd have to host a party or host an event, host a lecture, host something in the space. So, you know, before you know it, you got up at 7 a.m., got to work by 8, and then you're leaving work at 10 just to start it all over again. And you would do that, we would do that for weeks, weeks, months. Um, more often than not, we were just dealing with problems and members coming up to us and complaining. Carl said the job was tough, especially for his younger employees who got blamed for the work frustrations of their customers. Like, it is somehow your problem. You did something wrong. The temperature in this office is why they didn't close that deal. You know, it's it's hard to tell a 23 or 24-year-old that this guy who's spitting in your face, so angry about a bad print job, and is not your problem and not your fault. We said the community employees were young, but so were a lot of the customers. Or at least they acted like it. Carl really learned a lot about humanity on this job. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You know, the crazy part is they'll have these office birthdays and just leave the cake out for, like, days. Just, like, cake, an open-air cake. So, yeah, mice everywhere. It was, like, it was a thing. It was, like, I've gotten to the point where I can tell you the perfect bait to use to get mice. I can tell you the right traps to use. I can tell you the right corners to use, what time of night they usually, like, move around. Um, It's crazy. Keep in mind, a lot of these employees are recent college grads, some of whom are in their first jobs. And they've been hired by this very exciting startup. And they're learning how to trap mice. The first go around, we used glue traps. Horrific. Don't ever use those. There are all these screaming mice that were trying to get off the trap. You couldn't take them off without ripping their skin off. And every, <laughs> every woman in the building, they were all like screaming, like, da, da. I had to do something because I, I had to put them out of their misery. So I like, basically had to, it was either I killed them myself or I threw them in the trash can. But it was like sticky pads of mice screaming, which is horrifying. <laughs> Members also brought in their dogs. Part of the beauty of WeWork was you could bring your dog to work. So adorable and so amazing. But at this, one of our buildings at Wonder Bread, uh, they let too many of the dogs off leash, and they became like their own pack of roving, roving, like, wolves. They just ran around, and there was, like, one dog was, like, the alpha, and <laughs> all the other dogs just, like, follow. It was just so crazy. And we got so many complaints. Everyone's like, what the hell's going on in the hallways? Because all you heard was, like, One dog would start sprinting, and like a whole pack of dogs would follow. Sometimes their job included dealing with party leftovers. We had so many parties where, you know, I think in my entire time, three times I found like a condom wrapper or a condom in a gross place. Like one in a phone booth, you know, one in the meditation room. So that's the reason the meditation room is have a door. Just gotta, can't trust people behind closed doors. So yeah, disgusting. People are awful, awful, awful. So what did Carl do the first time he saw a used condom? The first time I gagged, I was like, well, and then I took a photo and I texted it to my team and like with the words WTF. And then it turns this whole chat like, oh, my God, where did you find it? Oh. And then it turns to a guessing game and then of who it was. And then me going through recordings trying to figure out who it was to have this super awkward chat with a member. Sadly, Carl couldn't figure out the condom culprit and he didn't want to leave his staff to deal with it. So he did what he thought a leader should do. So yeah, I put on a glove, looked away, picked it up, threw it in the trash. Disgusting. Gross. Gross, gross, gross. And it wasn't just condoms. There was one other unfortunate party favor. Oh, yeah. Parties. Yeah, people vomited in the weirdest places. Um, some guys just can't... Women got, well, men and women can't hold their booze. And the, you know the good thing about a phone booth? It, they turn dark when you close the door. So you open it, you vomit, you close it, and nobody will find it until they open it again. So. so yes, if your CEO is bragging about serving 90,000 beers a month, you might witness some of the side effects of heavy drinking. But that's what's funny about Carl. Even though he had to deal with the disgusting aftermath, he still thinks that beer is part of what made WeWork special and attractive. I mean, obviously, a lot of these things wouldn't have happened without the parties, but the parties kind of kept the momentum of the space going. Uh, I see a lot of new co-working spaces now that are like, this is co-working space for adults and blah, blah, blah. But they're just not as fun. Uh, say what you will about the, the drinking culture, which definitely got out of hand many a times. Um, 
it was the only place doing it. And it was wild. And it was fun. And it kept people talking. So Carl defended a lot of aspects of the job, even though it sometimes made him miserable. A- everybody at WeWork, I don't care what position they were, had a moment where they felt like crying. So many of Carl's employees cried at work that he developed a standard line of advice for them. So rather than lose employees or have them completely freak out in front of a member, I always tell employees, hey, listen, like, if you ever have that moment, grab somebody who will cover the desk for you and just go take as long of a walk as you need. And he had advice on where to cry, too. Uh, Well, if your building wasn't sold out, you can find an empty office. It's pretty good. Usually supply rooms were okay. Wherever you can, just don't do it in front of members. And if you need to talk to someone, talk to somebody on your team or talk to me. That was the rule. And during this whole period, actually, I remember a lot of former employees talking to me about this feeling of chaos. How WeWork seemed from the outside like this rocket ship destined for the moon. But on the inside, it was growing so quickly that you couldn't keep up. It was basically just smile through the tears. (laughs) Actually, this was one of my first big breakthroughs in reporting on WeWork. Again, at the time, almost all the press coverage of WeWork was so positive. But I kept finding employees who were burnt out and frustrated, and also feeling betrayed. They'd been told so many positive things by their employer about doing what you love, only to find that working there was a disheartening experience. As I talked to them, I kept learning more and more about how they felt wronged and mistreated by WeWork. It was one of the first hints to me that there was something off. I kept thinking that it can't be this successful of a company if its employees are so unhappy, right? That's next time on Foundering. Foundering is hosted by me, Ellen Hewitt. Sean Wen is our executive producer. Maya Cueva is our associate producer. Ray Mondo mixed the show today. Magnus Henriksen helped us with recordings. Mark Millian, Anne Vandermeer, and Alistair Barr are our story editors. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe, and if you like our show, leave a review. Most importantly, tell your friends. See you next time.